Welcome to Simplify. I'm Ben Schumann Stoller. And I'm Caitlin Schiller. Simplify is for anybody who's taken a close look at their habits, their happiness, their relationships, or their health, and thought, there's got to be a better way to do this. Okay, so I got to be honest. I never really thought about simplifying, quote unquote, simplifying today's topic until I actually heard the interview. And I'm actually still a little bit surprised by it. Is it because of your tortured relationship to optimism, Ben? Uh, well, that, <laughs> thanks. But, but also, um, just the idea that luck is a thing you can engineer. It's a cool concept, and it's cool you got to talk about it with Janice Kaplan. Um, for people who don't know, Kaplan is a New York Times bestseller uh, with books The Gratitude Diaries and I'll See You Again. She was also the editor-in-chief of Parade Magazine, which used to be one of the biggest magazines in America. Or yeah, maybe I totally still remember is. that. I yeah. remember seeing it on, on newsstands in the supermarket all the time. Yeah, she's also been a TV producer, a writer. Um, for this book, which is called How Luck Happens, she teamed up with evolutionary biologist Barnaby Marsh, who's also an economist, and they talk about a formula for luck. And it's kind of like a lot of things we talk about on Simplify. If you take a step back, even with luck, if you take a step back and try to figure out how to make it happen once, you can probably make it happen again. Exactly. This book is kind of a manual on how to make more luck in your own life. So in our chat, Janice and I cover the idea of weak ties, risk floors, and how luck is other people, but probably not your mom. And when, if luck refuses to show up, you should give up or change tactics. Cool. So here's the interview with you, Caitlin Schiller, and Janice Kaplan. Um, as always, you and I will join up again at the end of the episode with the bookend where we'll wrap up this topic of luck and make a book list so people can read more if they're interested. All right, then. Catch you guys on the bookend. See you then. Could you please introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Janice Kaplan, and I am the author of the new book, How Luck Happens. Very cool. So we're going to talk about luck and what luck is and what luck isn't. What is luck to you? What is your definition? Well, you know, we did in this book um, decide to turn the definition of luck on its head because we do tend to think of luck as being random chance. And my thought was that if you wait for random chance to happen, you're probably going to be waiting for a really long time. So we started looking at luck as being at the intersection of random chance and talent and hard work. And let me explain those second two. By talent, I don't mean that you have to sing like Beyonce, though, of course, that never hurts. <laughs> um, but talent is a whole bucket of things that includes your ability to recognize opportunities, to see possibilities, to do things a little differently sometimes, what we call zig when others zag, and sometimes to take a little bit of risk. Hard work is, I'm afraid to say, hard work. <laughs> There's no getting around that one. <laughs> But if you put those two together, if you put those buckets of talent and hard work together, then you have two big parts of the equation in place. And when random chance, that third part of the equation comes along, then you either don't have to worry about it if it's something bad or unfortunate in terms of random chance, or you get to take advantage of it and really make something wonderful out of it if it's something good. So it gives you a much greater sense of control over your own life and your own possibilities. So when you were researching for the book, what did you, I'm sure that you talked to a lot of people about what you were working on, just regular people, maybe friends. What did you find people got wrong about luck? Well, the first question everybody asked me was, oh, are you buying a lottery ticket? And um, <laughs> and a, a lottery is a really bad uh, example of luck. Um, a lottery is uh, statistically improbable that you'll win. Um, the odds are against you. There is no way you can change the odds. There is nothing <laughs> that you can do about it. And so that is just, you know, pure random chance. And so I, I try to explain that really thinking about luck uh, has to come from a different perspective. So the second thing that I would hear all the time from people is that they would talk about how they had, uh, had had some event in their own lives that was a complete lucky occurrence and that their entire career had occurred because of that. Let me give you an example. One very successful entrepreneur told me that, that uh, he just happened to be sitting next to an investor at an event who offered to support him. And his company is now worth a, a huge fortune. Well, that's a great story, right? An entire career and company turned on where you happen to be sitting. But I said to him, let's take it back a couple of steps. 
you had a great idea. You know, this was an entrepreneur. He had been working on this idea for years. He went to the dinner because he'd networked with someone who could connect him to that investor. And when he sat next to him, he had the right thing to say to him. That's not luck. That's putting everything in place. And I can tell you that if I happened to be sitting next to that investor, I would not now have a hundred million dollar company. <laughs> um, so you have to set yourself up to be lucky. And I think so often when we take the position that, oh, I just happened to be sitting there and it was just this random lucky event, we sound very humble and it seems very lovely that circumstances and serendipity have taken over. But there's a danger to that, which is that we don't recognize that we can do it again. And if we do stop and think what put us in that position, how we got to that dinner, what we said, the three years we had spent preparing and thinking about this company we wanted to start, when we realize all that went into it, then we realize that maybe we can do it again. If we see life as just being a complete random event, then, then you're at the, uh, the winds of, of whatever happens. You know, this, this story that you just shared made me think about the section in your book about how other people help you create luck. And you talk about something called weak ties and how they're the bringers of good luck. Can you explain a little bit about what a weak tie is and how that works and helps people get more luck? Well, luck is very much other people or from other people, I think. And we tend to think that the people who are going to make us lucky are those closest to us, right? Mom and dad are looking out for us, best friends, you know, your, your closest circle. But those people all know the same people that you do. They know the same opportunities that you do. They're in the same circle that you are. If you look at that next circle of people, or even that third circle beyond, the people who maybe you talk to a couple of times a year or, or encounter now and then, but do keep up a connection with, those are your weak ties. And sociologists have the wonderful phrase where they refer to the strength of weak ties. Because interestingly, it is those people in that farther out circle, those weak ties, who tend to create luck for you, who tend to find possibilities that you don't know about, who know people that you don't know about, who can connect you to others. Could you speak a little bit about optimism and its role in luck? Optimism is incredibly important in creating luck. And um, I don't mean that in any mystical sense. You know, people like to say, oh, um, is it true that if I just think something and put it out to the universe, the universe will respond? And my answer is no, <laughs> the universe will not respond unless you do something. Um, but on the other side of that, if you believe in something, if you really want something, if you're very focused on it, then you are much more likely to take the steps that are going to make it occur. You're going to, to move forward in a way that, that will make an event uh, that you care about happen. Um, we interviewed um, Dr. Martin Seligman at the University of Pennsylvania, who's often considered the sort of uh, founders or starter father um, of positive psychology. He, by the way, says that he's a very negative person himself, um, but has managed to, to, to get over it by realizing the importance of being positive. And um, he said that if he were, uh, you know, going off on a space flight and he needed one person along for good luck, the number one trait that he would look for would be somebody who was optimistic. Um, and there are so many different reasons for that. It is, as I said, if you believe in something, you're going to focus and, and try to make it happen. The other thing is that if you're negative and pessimistic, you tend to be very downwardly focused. You know, you, you tend to not look around you. You tend to just kind of be in a little hole and only be seeing the negative that's in front of you. Whereas if you're positive and optimistic, you quite literally lift your head up. <laughs> you quite literally look around and look for the sunshine and look for the brightness and look for the positive things. Uh, and, and when you do that, you're much more likely to be able to make things happen. So I think that that little twist um, of being able to, to see the positive has so many uh, positive effects in life. It's, it's what I found when I wrote about gratitude, and it's certainly what I found when I wrote about luck also. Mm. Well, that's, a, that's a really nice thing to hear. And I, that, that makes it sound so so weak. But it's nice to know that that looking on the bright side actually can be very useful. It also re reminded me of the part in your book where you talk about failure. Um, and I have something that I, I dog-eared here is many of life's failures are people who did not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. 
how do you know when to keep trying and when to give up? Is that something that you you found out about at all in your research? Persistence is really important in making luck. And we talked to the mathematician Leonard Lodino, who who explained it to me that in the terms of that you need you need a lot of at bats, and that can make up for your being a lousy hitter. Um, as, as he explained it, you know, he talked about two people of different abilities: one who succeeds ninety nine percent of the time, and one who succeeds only one percent of the time. And sometimes the less talented person can seem to be incredibly lucky at landing a great job or an acting part or or a loving spouse. But there's a good chance that he's changed his odds by not giving up and having more at bats. So think of it this way. If you try a hundred times, um, you might succeed because the statistics are on your side, right? It's how you turn a, a 1% person, as it were, into a 99% person. Um, so the less obviously talented person who, who keeps trying, um, is eventually going to get that hit and get the same success as the superstar who only needs to try once. I, I hope that makes sense. Um, but, but the other side of that is, when do you stop? When are you being too persistent, <laughs> right? Um, we talk in the, we talk in the book about people like uh, John Grisham and Dr. Seuss and uh, and J.K. Rowling who wrote the Harry Potter books and how many times they were rejected. You know, hundreds of times I think it was for John Grisham and and similar numbers for Dr. Seuss and they were each willing, you know, ready to give up when they tried just one more time and then of course became huge successes. But the other side of that is if your book has been turned down 200 times by publishers, it's very possible that you've written a lousy book and you <laughs> should go, you should go on and do something else. So how do you make that decision? How do you know when you should keep persisting? How do you know when you should keep trying to get more of those at bats? And I think one way to look at it is to see how close you've become, how close you've gotten each time. If you're trying to be an actor, and you you get rejected on the first round for every audition you go to, maybe it's time to go to law school. But if you keep getting up to, you know, it's just between you and that one other person, and you don't get it, and it's between you and three other people, and you don't get it, that means you have the talent. That means you, you have the ability. And it is just going to take that persistence and that extra hard work. So you need to be a little honest with yourself, perhaps, and, and really look at what, what you're hearing back. Um, and, uh, but give yourself that chance. Have that persistence. Get up to bad enough times that you can get that hit. And again, you don't necessarily have to be the most talented. Um, sometimes you can make the luck by just making sure that you, you keep swinging. Hmm. Jenna's personal question. Have you had a moment when you almost gave up on something and then suddenly struck it lucky? Um, I've had a career where I've done a number of different things. I've been a TV producer and I've been a magazine editor and I've written uh, a, a dozen books. And um, I think one of the ways that I've always been able to make luck is to go back and forth by different things. And Hmm. for me, it's not so much having a backup plan, though I think uh, we've discovered that that is actually a good way to get lucky, but by having diversity. And um, we saw that uh, frequently with many of the entrepreneurs that we spoke to. You know, there's a myth in America that if you want to be successful, you have to throw everything into what you're doing. And we hear those stories of the executives who used their last dime to start their company. Well, that's all well and good, but when you look at those stories, very often they did have a backup plan. Very often they had what they saw as a floor on the on the risk that they were taking or something else that they might be able to do. And um, in, in many ways, I think that gives you an added ability because you're not so scared. You're, you're, you're not so worried. You are able to throw yourself fully into something and be really excited about it. But no, if it wipes out, you can, you know, land on your butt. But, but you're going to stand up, stand up again. And, and um, we found that over and over again with people, again, when you get behind the myths of the stories um, of some of these startup companies, um, that they were, many of the people uh, had, again, as I said, had that floor on their, on their risk or had that uh, diversity in their lives. And um, for me, that, that diversity was, was always really important. Yeah, I think I think I've also benefited from that. I always had some sort of backup plan. And it tends to be more fun too, you know, for for a while early in my career when I 
had been a TV producer and I had been a magazine editor and, I, and I'd written a few books at that point and I thought, oh gosh, if only I had focused on one of these, you know, <laughs> I would have been more successful. Um, but then as my career went on, I, I realized how very important it was to have that um, diversity, not only as a, a fallback uh, from one to another, but because there's great enrichment that each gets from the other. I think my, my writing and my journalism is much enriched by, by the experiences that I've had in, in other fields that my whole life hasn't been just, just sitting and writing. So I think that having those different avenues makes luck in many different ways and makes luck within each of the paths that you choose also. Hey guys, it's Ben. We're taking a quick break from Caitlin and Janice Kaplan so that I can give a quick shout out and a recommendation to uh, the bonus episode of season one, which is about how to read faster by Abby Marks Beal. Like the thing is at Simplify, we always try to, we don't just pick the best, 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 crazy, hyped, bestseller, famous author people, although we like talking to them also. We also try to pick books that we think would actually make a difference in your life. So that's why we picked Luck. And that's why in the first season, we picked um, Abby Mark Spiel book, 10 Days to Faster Reading. And like the interview that we did back then is full of tips to be a faster reader. And you should buy the book. It's small and you can read it very fast. Anyway, look it up or go to the Blinkist magazine and search Abby Mark Spiel and Simplify. That's enough for me. Let's get back to Caitlin and Janice Kaplan. And I'll catch you guys in that bookend. Have fun. See you soon. What's something that you learned while you were researching for the book that really surprised you? I assume there was something. <laughs> Maybe not. But is there anything that really bowled you over? I think I was most surprised by the concept of um, zigging when others zag. Uh, you know, I've, I've always been a good girl, and I've always gone in a very straight, straight path. And um, it was pretty exciting to me to encounter so many people who have been successful by doing something very different. We, we spoke to Dr. Jim Watson, uh, who was, uh, along with Watson and Crick, uh, who helped discovered the, uh, the structure of DNA, and he was very very ardent that nobody has ever become successful by thinking in standard ways, by going in standard paths. Now, Dr. Watson has, of course, raised some great controversies and caused himself some great troubles um, by going in some very politically incorrect paths uh, later in his life. Um, but uh, in terms of his scientific achievements, I, I think those those stand um, w without question. And uh, he certainly said that, that you can't have a scientific achievement without without thinking differently. And some of the things that look like luck in science are really just that you've been able to, to look in a different direction. Um, in a very different field, one of my favorite stories was uh, a television executive named Mike Darnell, who uh, was at uh, Fox Television early on in his career. And he was one of the people who actually pretty much started reality television. Now, this may be for good or bad, um, but, uh, and he said he very carefully chose a lane where nobody else was at the time. Nobody was doing reality television when he chose to do that. And this was a big risk. Television is a field where everybody copies each other. And so trying to be different, um, you know, was kind of risky, but he also felt that he was never going to be able to succeed unless he did something very different, chose his own lane. Uh, the result of that was that everybody made fun of the shows that he put on the air. He had shows like Temptation Island and Joe Millionaire, and they were scorned by all of the other networks. But then when a, a, a TV executive from the UK named Simon Fuller came to America with the idea for a a TV show, uh, none of the executives in Hollywood would talk to him because who wanted to talk to a reality TV show guy? Mike talked to him. Mike loved his idea. Mike put it on the air as a summer replacement, and it became American Idol, um, which was, of course, oh. <laughs> the biggest show in television history. And he says that only happened because he was trying to do something different, because he was trying to think differently than, than other people. And that's been very exciting to me to think of the idea of that you, that you can make luck by thinking of yourself as a lucky person, being willing to try something different, to go in a completely different direction and see what happens. Yeah. 
something that I've been wondering about as these stories stack up, the these wonderful anecdotes you've been sharing, is that these are people who are already well poised to glean luck. They're people who already have positions of power, already have a network. Is there a limitation to thinking about luck as something you can create for yourself? What about people who who are disadvantaged? Great question. Um, But I think it's really important to realize that the principles that hold for creating luck hold wherever you start and from whatever position that you're in. It's very easy to look up, <laughs> to look upwards um, at somebody and say, oh, they're so lucky. Uh, they, you know, of course they can make more luck because look where they're starting from. Of course they should be grateful. Look where they're starting from. But it's harder to look down, right? And realize how many people are looking up at us that way and saying, wow, you are in a great position. You're in a position where you can do something. And um, I think all of us, no matter where we start, If we follow those ideas of looking for possibilities, of seeking opportunities, of looking for help from others, um, we can start to create luck within our own uh, our own spheres. I, I guess the point is that the possibilities are there. So often, the possibilities are either blatantly in front of us, as was the case in in those stories or are less obvious, but still still possible. And um, our jobs, no matter where we're starting, no matter who we are, no matter what cultural expectations we have around us, are to be able to take advantage, make the luck for ourselves, create the possibilities within within the realms that we have. So then it's more about learning the principles and the rules and starting where you are. I think so. I think that no matter where you are, no matter who you are, you can create luck. And um, I've I've been very moved by the people who I encounter as I'm speaking, um, both about luck and about gratitude, who talk about the very, very difficult positions that they have been in. I hear over and over again uh, people who come up to me and tell me about just terrible situations they've had, uh, health situations they've had, tragedies in their families. And they'll say, but you know, I really feel that it was so lucky because it brought me closer to my husband or it made me appreciate something. Uh, and, And to be able to have, and it goes back to that optimism and that positive outlook we were talking about before, to be able to take your own situation that may be difficult, that may have started from a a, a difficult position, and to be able to find the luck in it, to be able to find the positivity in it and the brightness in it is really a wonderful thing to do. And and it changes your life. Hmm. What do you say to people who think that what you just described sounds like lying to yourself? Because it's, it's rewriting of your own story. I guess if you're a pessimist, there's the temptation to say, this is a terrible thing that happened to me. And I think a lot of pessimists think that pessimism is reality. So if you if you dare to reframe your narrative in a way that, mm, you know, I had this this horrible accident, but it brought me closer to my family, they look at it and say, yeah, but you're just kidding yourself. What do you think of that idea? Yeah, it is amusing, isn't it, that um, that negative people always think that they have the real way of looking at things, and positive people are somehow <laughs> distorting it. It's very amusing. Yeah. I, I know that that's that's always the case, um, and uh, you know, I I don't I don't think that's that's accurate. Um, but I also think it's it it's not just your way of looking at it, though that's very important, but it's what you then do with that. Um, luck comes from actions. Gratitude comes from actions. Um, there's, a, there's a story that I like um, of the author Lee Child, uh, the international best-selling author of the Jack Reacher uh, thriller novels that were turned into movies with Tom Cruise. And uh, Lee told me that he didn't start writing those books until he was fired from his job as a TV producer in the UK. And he had been a TV producer for about a producer director for about a dozen years. He thought he was going to do that forever. There was a change in management. He got fired and he didn't know what to do. He had a wife, he had a daughter, he had a mortgage, he had a car payment. He was furious and upset and, and just couldn't imagine what could possibly happen in his life next. It was just, you know, mired in that, uh, in that fear and negativity. And, and he decided that he couldn't do anything other than try to do something positive and, and do something that he had always wanted to do, which was to start writing. And so he decided to see that really 
a negative stroke of bad luck, that being fired as an opportunity. And he took it that way. Now, when you're fired from your job, you don't know that you are going to become an international best-selling writer and that your books are going to be turned into movies with Tom Cruise. I understand that. You're, you're in a tough position. But, um, you know, he said, and I think it's a really wonderful point, you don't have a choice. Uh, take that stroke of bad luck and think how it could possibly be a stroke of good luck. Um, as I said, what you're trying to do is think of a lucky life. So that moment of bad luck may feel lousy right then. It may feel lousy for a month or a year. But the bigger question is, how are you going to, what can you do so that you're going to be able to look back on that in a couple of years as something that was actually a lucky opportunity? And uh, I actually spoke to a, a, an astrophysicist named Pete Hutt, and, and his suggestion was that when you're caught in a bad situation, uh, again, you tend to sort of, you know, just see where you are. You just focus on that little hole and you keep digging yourself digger, deeper and deeper. And he said, pull back, kind of float above yourself. Try to look down from above and see, and, and see where you are. You can almost sort of physically picture it as if you're standing in a forest, you know, and, and, and you can only see that little, uh, you know, tree in front of you. But if you pull back, maybe you can start to see some paths that you hadn't seen before. Maybe you can start to see that where you're standing actually leads in a different direction, um, than you, than you realized. And, um, I, I like that because pulling back is not something that we normally do, but it is a wonderful way to create luck because it does allow us to to look out, to look up, to see the paths that we might not have have, have otherwise seen. And by the way, Pete has a an asteroid named after him, so you know we can we can trust oh, him. Oh, <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> Just an asteroid. Good. Well, you know, as long as it's not Earthbound, we can trust him. There you go. <laughs> um, I just wanted to switch tracks a little bit and ask you about how what you learned about luck applies to romance. How does someone get lucky in love? Yeah, we all want to get lucky in love. And um, I'm afraid I'm going to turn really unromantic on you here. Because as we did the research um, over and over again, psychologists, uh, important psychologists like Dan Ariely and, and uh, Barry Schwartz, uh, who used to be at Swarthmore, who did all of the work on choice, um, told us that the best way to get lucky in love is to invest in a relationship. That we tend to think of love as being, you know, created the, the day you get married, right? Or the day you meet somebody. You know, these great, we've all watched too many romantic comedies um, where uh, love falls from the sky and, uh, and we live ha happily ever after. But anybody who has been married for more than a minute and a half knows that that's not true and that, um, that you make a relationship. And by investing in the relationship, by treating the other person's needs as important as your own is how you create what looks to others like that very close and bonded and very lucky relationship. And interestingly, it's the same thing if you're looking for love. Um, it's, there are, it's, it's so easy now uh, online to just keep swiping, right? Keep going to the next person, and there's always going to be somebody else out there. And we spoke to Helen Fisher, who, um, who has written extensively about sex and romance and, and also is uh, one of the, the science, science advisor to Match.com. So you would think that she would have told us, you know, just go online and keep looking until you get lucky in love. And, and she said quite the opposite. She said, as the other psychologists did, um, you can get overwhelmed and you really have to stop and limit your choices. I think she said, you know, three to five or five to seven um, people. And then from there, meet them, sit down, invest, take some time. Um, it's really easy to meet people online, but as far as I know, nobody ever got married online. You actually have to take the time to, to invest in a relationship, whether it's at the very start of it, when you're trying to meet somebody, or uh, whether it's after you've, you've already made the commitment. Um, but lucky in love also, uh, you know, it, it is very different, I think, than the, uh, than the romantic uh, notions that we have, that we have of it. Okay, you have a whole entire chapter on kids and luck and teaching children about what luck is. You've already raised a, a son, at least one son, who you mentioned in the book, up to adulthood. If you were to, to raise a child now, how would you use what you learned about luck in your parenting? 
you know, part of the point of the Raising Lucky Kids chapter is the idea that, um, you know, parenting is complicated. Um, but basically, lucky kids are happy kids. And lucky kids are kids who know that they have some control over their own lives. And lucky kids realize that they're not going to find happiness necessarily by going only in one direction. And uh, um, I, I spoke to uh, a woman named Jessica Levenstein, who's the head of a, a very wonderful private school uh, in Manhattan um, called Horace Mann. And uh, Jessica was talking about how kids in, in a situation like that very elite private school tend to have parents who are very successful in their careers and to see luck as being something preordained, you know, that they need to get into the right school so that they can get into the right business school so that they can get the right job at the right investment bank so that they can earn a lot of money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And she said that she feels her job is to make lucky kids by showing them that there are so many things that they could do, that there are so many possibilities in so many cities that they've never even heard of <laughs> yet, and uh, so many opportunities that they have. And she actually tries to bring in people uh, back to speak at school assemblies who graduated the school, who went off in different directions, who you know became a chef, or or uh, who uh, who moved to Berlin and started doing uh, an interesting company there themselves. Um, so so that she could show them different kinds of things. And I think that's a great gift we can give to our children to make them lucky, to realize that there are other opportunities that they can have and that they can create their own lives. Um, I think we make lucky kids also by giving them that sense early on that they can control certain things in their lives. Um, and uh, I, I actually just spoke recently to the head of a nursery school. Um, and uh, he was talking about the importance of letting kids, you know, be unusual and be different and go in, in, in different paths. And I said to him, well, that's okay maybe when they're in nursery school, but, you know, then they get to third grade and they're expected to sit down and, you know, be good and spell. <laughs> and uh, and he said, you know, we, we could probably do very well by our children by starting to recognize that quirky and different isn't bad. And, and, and I think that's, I think that's very lovely. Um, to, uh, to encourage our children to be who they are is one of the great ways, uh, to make them lucky. And by the way, we can start with that when our children are toddlers, right? Um, by, it's, it's a fine, it's a fine balance. Uh, we, you know, we need our kids to, to be able to be social and, and in, and in public situations, but we also need to recognize that they are going to make luck. They are going to make luck for themselves and for the world, um, by, by being who they are and by being a little different and by being able to see things differently. I, it's occurred to me as we were talking, or as you were you were talking so eloquently about luck and how it's the the intersection of talent and hard work and random chance. And mostly, your book focuses on the talent and hard work portion of it and how we can gain control of luck. But is there a darker side of all this control? Is it? Do you think that it has the potential to be burdensome, and people could just blame themselves? I think maybe one of the beauties of of how we traditionally conceive of luck is that it's out of our hands. But what do you think is ultimately the more empowering stance? That's a really interesting question. Um, I don't think it's empowering at all to think of life as being out of our hands. Um, I think it's kind of scary. And I think most of us would like to be able to feel like there is something uh, we can do in, in, in dif different and difficult situations. You know, certainly there are going to be things that, that befall us. There are going to be medical problems that, that befall us. But m most of us, if, if, we, if we get ill, we don't just sit back and say, hmm, let me see what luck brings. Let me see what happens. We try to see what the pr appropriate steps are, what we can do, how we can make ourselves better, how we can take that unfortunate event that has just occurred to us uh, or befallen us and, and, and make, it, make it so that we can go on and be healthy and, and be better. I think that knowing that more of life is under your control than you had might have thought um, is really very empowering and and gives you a bit of a sense of relief um, that uh, that uh, that you can grab some control back. Hmm. Good. So, if you could leave everyone listening today with one idea about luck that 
that could change how they conceive of it or pursue it, what would it be? I think it's really important to recognize that you can create luck for yourself and that the first thing to do is to define to yourself what you mean by a lucky life to define for yourself what you mean by luck, what is going to feel good to you, because it may be different for individuals. And you don't necessarily have to have the same definition uh, as, as everybody else. But knowing what to you, you're going to be able to look back at the end of your life and say, wow, that was a lucky life. Um, you want to start being able to move toward that in whatever way you can. And sure, there are going to be all sorts of random things that, that uh, you don't expect. But if you have that bigger view and if you're able to incorporate things as they come along, take them along, figure out how you can turn them around, make the negative positive, then you are whatever happens, however you're buffeted by life, good and bad, you are ultimately going to be able to say, I did it. I, I did what I could to make a lucky life. Okay, last question. I always like to ask our guests, what have you read lately that you've enjoyed? You know, I, I actually just um, finished Walter Isaacson's book, Innovators, and I found it really interesting um, to, uh, he, he's a wonderful writer, and he also looks at so many different people and uh, what innovation is really all about. Um, and some of the women who have been <laughs> overlooked um, in, in the world, uh, as well as uh, just a new approach to to what that means. And so I really enjoy um, uh, all the books, uh, nonfiction books that, that give us a new, a new approach to things. Uh, there's a brand new book that just came out called New Power uh, by, by Henry Timms, um, which is also about uh, seeing the world from a different perspective and uh, changing the old top-down power to, um, to uh, uh, a more equitable uh, form of, of, of new power. And uh, I like things that give us uh, hope and positivity of, of a ways to think about the world in different ways. And, and both of those books certainly do that. All right. Well, Janice, that's, that's it from my side. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk today. It's been a really illuminating conversation about luck. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. Welcome to the bookend, where we end with books. And today, more talk about luck. Luck talk. Luck talk. Right. So let's do that part first and talk about this interview a little bit. Why did you want to have Janice Kaplan on Simplify? Well, so this season has had a lot of sex, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. which is, you know, great and fine. But on Simplify, we like to mix it up a little bit and bring you some time management stuff, some relationship stuff, and then some stuff that you might not have thought you wanted to know anything else about. <laughs> and when we saw that How Luck Happens was being released, we thought that is perfect. That is exactly the kind of oddball topic that will round out the season and make it memorable and interesting. So yeah. It seemed like a great topic, and I figured that Janice would be great to talk to because she's had so much experience. Yeah. And, I mean, once you got into the book, you started to learn a little bit more about what Kaplan's theories about luck actually is and was, I guess. Yeah. And, like, so then what? So, yeah, gradually as I looked at that book and as Janice and I talked, it became really clear that that we have the tools to make more luck for ourselves and why not take advantage of them? Why not use those mindset shifts and the habits of thought to make our own lives feel richer and more magical instead of waiting for magic to happen to us? I mean, that way it's like we get to be the magicians. Indeed. So of everything you guys covered in this talk, which was a lot more ri wide ranging than just about luck, I think it's fair to say, mm -hmm. what's like the one thing you took away from it? What should people remember? That's actually really easy for once. The thing that I think is really important to remember is that to a huge extent, luck comes from the story you tell yourself. As in, even if not so great things happen, how can you shift your own story so that this negative stroke of luck can feel like an opening for something else? And I don't mean at all to imply that everything can be alchemized into a positive. Some things are just genuinely awful and need to be respected as such before you can move on to moving on. What I actually mean is, what can a circumstance that might not be ideal bring to light for you that you didn't see before? That new piece of information and what you do with it is your ticket to creating a luckier life going forward. So telling yourself stories. Basically. But not lying to yourself. It's not sort lying of, to yourself. It's kind of just understanding what you're going through. Yeah. Getting really honest with, with your own circumstances and instead of getting stuck in them, deciding how you can use what you've learned to act as a springboard and not as a stopping point. Cool. Yeah. So I have some books. 
Awesome. It's the, my first one is totally related to your sort of your takeaway. Um, cause there's a moment in the interview when, when Janice Kaplan tells you, think of a lucky life. And I had to think of Grant, I think it's pronounced Grant Achatz or Grant Achatz. Um, Achatz. <laughs> Achatz. <laughs> His memoir is called Life on the Line. He's a, um, oh. he's like a amazing chef. He has a restaurant, Alinea in Chicago, which was number one in the world for a couple of years. Um, in his early 30s, he was diagnosed with like a really bad cancer of the tongue. What a weird cancer for a chef to get. Right. And so he's one of the world's best chefs. He's facing a choice. Have surgery to remove his tongue, never be able to taste again, or suffer through chemo and risk not surviving. He has two small sons. Like, any, anyway, it's this crazy story. He found a doctor who suggested a third way and he came out okay. I won't ruin the whole story for you. It's super emotional and intense. In the memoir, in the memoir there's a moment, I don't know why it like struck me so much. I was like really... I was really like emotional reading back over this time, like this moment that the doctor walks in, he's going from doctor to doctor. It seems hopeless. He's yeah. like either going to die as a great chef or stop what he's great at and continue living, but like as half of himself. Anyway, at some point, a doctor walks into an examination room and says something like, I could tell us about you the moment I saw you. You're a lucky one. This isn't your time yet. Wow. And, but the thing is like, with the help of his investor and friend, he's he drags himself to doctors and treatments all over the country. And in the meantime, he's working like 16-hour days at the world's number one restaurant, hiding from everybody that he's in like excruciating pain and hanging out with his family and like trying to keep the things that kept him going running. So I don't know. Maybe he was lucky. Maybe he put himself in the best position to survive or not survive, but in the best way for himself, his children, his friends, his ambitions, his dreams. I don't know. And I just, uh, there are a lot of stories of people overcoming this kind of stuff, but something about that line of like, you're a lucky one. I could tell this about you. Um, and that became part of his story. Exactly. And he just told, kept telling himself like, I'm, it's not my time. I'm lucky. It's not my time. Exactly. That's really interesting. So wow, yeah. That sounds great. Yeah. So that book is called Life on the Line. And um, sounds like a great memoir if you love food and chefs. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> and who doesn't, right? <laughs> All right. Moving on. What else you got? Right. So as part of her research for the book, Janice Kaplan spoke to behavioral economist Dan Ariely. Mm -hmm. um, he's the best-selling author of, among other things, The Upside of Irrationality. And um, I have it with me. Hold on. It's full of studies. But there's one. Full of studies. Full of studies. <laughs> Sound of pages in the microphone. <laughs> um, he's, he's quoting some studies that compared overall life happiness among three groups. Yeah. Paraplegics, lottery winners, and normal people who were neither disabled nor particularly lucky. Okay. Um, had the I'm going to read this straight from the book. Had the data collection taken place immediately following the event that led to the disability or the day after the lottery won, one would expect the paraplegics to be far more miserable than the normal people and the lottery winners much happier than the normal people. But it turned out, um, because the data was actually collected a year after the event, it turned out that although there were differences in happiness levels, they weren't as pronounced as you might expect. Mm. While the paraplegics weren't as satisfied with life as the normal people and the lottery winners were more satisfied, both paraplegics and lottery winners were surprisingly close to normal levels of life satisfaction, wow. which means basically that though a life-altering event such as a bad injury or winning a lottery can have a huge initial impact on happiness, to a large degree, it wears off over time. Yeah, that's so interesting. So like these crazy lucky events... They maybe don't have the huge life-changing right. thing effect that we think they do. Well, I think I've also read somewhere that we all have kind of like a set point of happiness, mm -hmm. and we we can experience fluctuation. <laughs> we can experience fluctuations based on what's going on in our lives, but we always kind of return close to our set point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like a crazy lucky event. Like I guess my point there is like, yeah, luck is important, but the other thing. I mean, there's so much else also that can define it. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. So you got a book? Yeah. My book is The Storytelling Animal by Jonathan Gottschall, and it talks about why humans are drawn to stories. And um, there's stuff on how the different functions that stories have affect us, what impact they have on our lives and for our species even, and how the activity of storytelling shapes who we think we are. It even talks about how being too realistic is actually pretty bad for your mental health. And so for all the dreamers out there, this book's for you. The Storytelling Animal. Yeah. That's cool. Yep. So we got... That's it. That's the last bookend of season three. It is the last bookend of season three. That's sad. That's we did a, a lot of books, though. We really did. I think we got some really good picks in there this time, too. If anybody out there read all of the books that we recommended, please email us so that we can send you new ones. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I haven't read all the books that we recommended. Did you? 
No, I've read a bunch of them, but definitely not all of them. Yeah. I also haven't read all the ones that our guests have recommended, though I have picked up a couple. I just got Down Girl, mm. the book that Emily Nagoski recommended. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of books. Yeah, it's a lot of books. Anyway. Cool. So, well, I guess that's it for season three of Simplify. Yeah. We're at a wrap here, but you will hear from us soon. In fact, you might start to hear more from us and more different stuff, too. So stay tuned. We'll be back in your ears before you know it. That was like a Caitlin Teasy voice. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> we don't have to, don't I, have to ruin I any like surprises. I like cliffhangers. That's yeah. fine. This episode of Simplify was produced by me, Ben Schumann Stoller, Caitlin Schiller, Nat Dorskina, and Odi Constantino, who's actually working on a Welsh translation of The Butterfly Jar. That shall see Silverstein children's, children's book of poetry. He's going to do it in Welsh. What a tender man. Cool. So if you enjoyed this episode of Simplify, send it to one person you like and make them lucky too. Podcasts or conversations. Use it to start one with someone that you like. Yeah. And thanks everyone who's already subscribed. Shout out to all the podcatchers out there. Pocket Casts, which I heard actually just got purchased. By, yeah. Crazy. Like, an NPR group. Good yeah. for them. Um, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Google Play, wherever you listen. That's awesome. If you don't know where to listen, you can always email us and we'll, we'll help, help you out. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to tell us about how you got lucky and not that kind of lucky, or you need some advice about podcatchers, you can tweet to us. I'm at Caitlin Schiller and Ben's at Bisto, B-S-T-O. Yeah. Somebody on Twitter was like, hey, at Caitlin, thanks to you and that other guy, but I don't understand what his actual Twitter handle is. Did you see that? No. Yeah. <laughs> yesterday on Twitter. So anyway, I'm not going to spell it out for you, but it's okay. Bisto. Also, Simplify is made by the same people who make Blinkist. And Blinkist, if you don't know, is a learning app that takes the insights of the world's best-selling nonfiction books and condenses them into these focused little capsules of knowledge that you can read or listen to in just 15 minutes or less. Cool. And if you want to try it out, we made another voucher code for this episode. That means you get 14 days free if you go to Blinkist.com slash friends and type in the voucher code LUCK. Yeah, so 14 days free, you can read... Um, the links to how luck happens and anything else that catches your fancy cool and you can always email us we're at podcast at blinkist.com we'd like to hear from you so do it yeah thanks so much for being with us this season stay tuned and we will be back with more smart stuff for you to listen to soon all right till next time check it out check it out bye bye